Book Six, Chapter One of the Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Wars of the Jews by Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Six, containing the interval of about one month, from the great extremity to which the Jews were reduced to the taking of Jerusalem by Titus. Chapter One. That the miseries still grew worse, and how the Romans made an assault upon the tower of Antonia. One. Thus did the miseries of Jerusalem grow worse and worse every day, and the seditious were still more irritated by the calamities they were under, even while the famine preyed upon themselves, after it had preyed upon the people. And indeed the multitude of carcasses that lay in heaps one upon another was a horrible sight, and produced a pestilential stench, which was a hindrance to those that would make sallies out of the city, and fight the enemy. But as those were to go in battle array, who had been already used to ten thousand murders, and must tread upon those dead bodies as they marched along, so were not they terrified, nor did they pity men as they marched over them, nor did they deem this affront offered to the deceased to be any ill omen to themselves. But as they had their right hands already polluted with the murders of their own countrymen, and in that condition ran out to fight with foreigners, they seemed to me to have cast a reproach upon God himself, as if he were too slow in punishing them. For the war was not now gone on with as if they had any hope of victory, for they gloried after a brutish manner in that despair of deliverance they were already in. And now the Romans, although they were greatly distressed in getting together their materials, raised their banks in one and twenty days, after they had cut down all the trees that were in the country that had joined to the city, and that for ninety furlongs round about, as I have already related. And truly the very view itself of the country was a melancholy thing, for those places which were before adorned with trees and pleasant gardens, were now become a desolate country every way, and its trees were all cut down. Nor could any foreigner that had formerly seen Judea and the most beautiful suburbs of the city, and now saw it as a desert, but lament and mourn sadly at so great a change. For the war had laid all the signs of beauty quite waste. Nor if any one that had known the place before had come on a sudden to it now, would he have known it again, but though he were at the city itself, yet would he have inquired for it, notwithstanding. 2. And now the banks were finished, they afforded a foundation for fear both to the Romans and to the Jews, for the Jews expected that the city would be taken, unless they could burn those banks, as did the Romans expect that, if these were once burnt down, they should never be able to take it, for there was a mighty scarcity of materials, and the bodies of the soldiers began to fail with such hard labours, as did their souls faint with so many instances of ill success. Nay, the very calamities themselves that were in the city proved a greater discouragement to the Romans than those within the city, for they found the fighting men of the Jews to be not at all mollified among such their sore afflictions, while they had themselves perpetually less and less hopes of success and their banks were forced to yield to the stratagems of the enemy, their engines to the firmness of their wall, and their closest fights to the boldness of their attack. And, what was their greatest discouragement of all, they found the Jews' courageous souls to be superior to the multitude of the miseries they were under, by their sedition, their famine, and the war itself, insomuch that they were ready to imagine that the violence of their attacks was invincible, and that the alacrity they showed would not be discouraged by their calamities. For what would not those be able to bear if they should be fortunate, who turned their very misfortunes to the improvement of their valour? These considerations made the Romans to keep a stronger guard about their banks than they had formerly had done. 3. But now John and his party took care for securing themselves afterward, even in case this wall should be thrown down and fell to their work before the battering rams were brought against them. 
Yet did they not compass what they endeavoured to do, but as they were gone out with their torches, they came back under great discouragement, before they came near to the banks. And the reasons were these, that, in the first place, their conduct did not seem to be unanimous, but they went out in distinct parties, and at distinct intervals, and after a slow manner, and timorously, and to say all in a word, without a Jewish courage, for they were now defective in what is peculiar to our nation, that is, in boldness, in violence of assault, and in running upon the enemy altogether, and in persevering in what they go about, though they do not at first succeed in it. But they now went out in a more languid manner than usual, and at the same time found the Romans set in array, and more courageous than ordinary, and that they guarded their banks, both with their bodies and their entire armour, and this to such a degree on all sides, that they left no room for the fire to get among them, and that every one of their souls was in such good courage, that they would sooner die than desert their ranks. For besides their notion that all their hopes were cut off, in case these their works were once burnt, the soldiers were greatly ashamed that subtlety should be quite too hard for courage, madness for armour, multitude for skill, and Jews for Romans. The Romans had now also another advantage, in that their engines for sieges cooperated with them in throwing darts and stones as far as the Jews, when they were coming out of the city, whereby the man that fell became an impediment to him that was next to him as did the danger of going farther make them less zealous in their attempts. And for those that had run under the darts, some of them were terrified by the good order and closeness of the enemy's ranks before they came to a close fight, and others were pricked with their spears and turned back again. At length they reproached one another for their cowardice, and retired without doing anything. This attack was made upon the first day of the month Panemus. Tammuz. So when the Jews were retreated, the Romans brought their engines, although they had all the while stones thrown at them from the tower of Antonia, and were assaulted by fire and sword, and by all sorts of darts, which necessity afforded the Jews to make use of. For although these had great dependence on their own wall, and a contempt of the Roman engines, yet did they endeavour to hinder the Romans from bringing them. Now these Romans struggled hard on the contrary, to bring them, as deeming that this zeal of the Jews was in order to avoid any impression to be made on the tower of Antonia, because its wall was but weak, and its foundations rotten. However, that tower did not yield to the blows given it from the engines, yet did the Romans bear the impressions made by the enemy's darts which were perpetually cast at them, and did not give way to any of those dangers that came upon them from above, and so they brought their engines to bear. But then, as they were beneath the other, and were sadly wounded by the stones thrown down upon them, some of them threw their shields over their bodies, and partly with their hands, and partly with their bodies, and partly with crows they undermined its foundations, and with great pains they removed four of its stones. Then night came upon both sides, and put an end to this struggle for the present. However, that night the wall was so shaken by the battering rams in that place, where John had used his stratagem before, and had undermined their banks, that the ground then gave way, and the wall fell down suddenly. 4. When this accident had unexpectedly happened, the minds of both parties were variously affected, for though one would expect that the Jews would be discouraged, because this fall of their wall was unexpected by them, and they had made no provision in that case, yet did they pull up their courage, because the tower of Antonia itself was still standing, as was the unexpected joy of the Romans at this fall of the wall soon quenched by the sight they had of another wall, which John and his party had built within it. However, the attack of this second wall appeared to be easier than that of the former, because it seemed a thing of greater facility to get up to it through the parts of the former wall that were now thrown down. This new wall appeared also to be much weaker than the Tower of Antonia, and accordingly the Romans imagined that it had been erected so much on the sudden that they should soon overthrow it. 
yet did not any body venture now to go up to this wall, for that such as first ventured so to do must certainly be killed. 5. And now Titus, upon consideration that the alacrity of soldiers in war is chiefly excited by hopes and by good words, and that exhortations and promises do frequently make men to forget the hazards they run, nay, sometimes to despise death itself, got together the most courageous part of his army, and tried what he could do with his men by these methods. "'O oh, fellow soldiers,' said he, "'to make an exhortation to men to do what hath no peril in it, is on that very account inglorious to such to whom that exhortation is made. And indeed so it is in him that makes the exhortation, an argument of his own cowardice also.' I therefore think that such exhortations ought then only to be made use of when affairs are in a dangerous condition, and yet are worthy of being attempted by every one themselves. Accordingly, I am fully of the same opinion with you, that it is a difficult task to go up this wall, but that it is proper for those that desire reputation for their valour to struggle with difficulties in such cases as will then appear when I have particularly shown that it is a brave thing to die with glory, and that the courage here necessary shall not go unrewarded in those that first begin the attempt. And let my first argument to move you to it be taken from what probably some would think reasonable to dissuade you. I mean the constancy and patience of these Jews, even under their ill successes. For it is unbecoming you, who are Romans and my soldiers, who have in peace been taught how to make wars, and who have also been used to conquer in those wars, to be inferior to Jews, either in action of the hand, or in courage of the soul, and this especially when you are at the conclusion of your victory, and are assisted by God himself. For as to our misfortunes, they have been owing to the madness of the Jews, while their sufferings have been owing to your valour, and to the assistance God hath afforded you. For as to the seditions they have been in, and the famine they are under, and the siege they now endure, and the fall of their walls without our engines, what can they all be but demonstrations of God's anger against them, and of his assistance afforded us? It will not therefore be proper for you, either to show yourselves inferior to those to whom you are really superior, or to betray that divine assistance which is afforded you. And indeed, how can it be esteemed otherwise than a base and unworthy thing, that while the Jews, who need not be much ashamed if they be deserted, because they have long learned to be slave to others, do yet despise death, that they may be so no longer, and do make sallies into the very midst of us frequently, not in hopes of conquering us, but merely for a demonstration of their courage? We, who have gotten possession of almost all the world that belongs to either land or sea, to whom it would be a great shame if we do not conquer them, do not at once undertake any attempt against our enemies, wherein there is much danger, but sit still idle, with such brave arms as we have, and only wait till the famine and fortune do our business themselves, and this when we have it in our power, with some small hazard, to gain all that we desire. For if we go up to this tower of Antonia, we gain the city. For if there should be any more occasion for fighting against those within the city, which I do not suppose there will, since we shall then be upon the top of the hill, and be upon our enemies before they can have taken breath, these advantages promise us no less than a certain and sudden victory. Footnote. Reland notes here very pertinently that the tower of Antonia stood higher than the floor of the temple or court adjoining to it, and that accordingly they descended thence into the temple, as Josephus elsewhere speaks also. End of footnote. As for myself, I shall at present waive any commendation of those who die in war, and omit to speak of the immortality of those men who are slain in the midst of their martial bravery. Footnote. In this speech of Titus we may clearly see the notions which the Romans then had of death, and of the happy state of those who died bravely in war, and the contrary estate of those who died ignobly in their beds by sickness. 
Relland here also produces two parallel passages, the one out of Atonia Janus Marcellinus, concerning the Alani, that, quote, they judged that man happy who laid down his life in battle, end quote. The other of Valerius Maximus, who says, quote, that the Cimbri and Celtiberi exulted for joy in the army, as being to go out of the world gloriously and happily. End of quote, and a footnote. Yet cannot I forbear to imprecate upon those who are of contrary disposition, that they may die in time of peace, by some distemper or, or other, since their souls are condemned to the grave together with their bodies. For what man of virtue is there who does not know, that those souls which are severed from their fleshly bodies in battles by the sword, are received by the ether, that purest of elements, and joined to that company which are placed among the stars, that they become good demons and propitious heroes, and show themselves as such to their posterity afterwards. While upon those souls that wear away, in and with their distempered bodies, comes a subterranean night to dissolve them to nothing, and a deep oblivion to take away all the remembrance of them, and this notwithstanding they be clean from all spots and defilements of this world, so that, in this ease, the soul at the same time comes to the utmost bounds of its life, and of its body, and of its memorial also. But since he hath determined that death is to come of necessity upon all men, a sword is a better instrument for that purpose than any disease whatsoever. Why is it not then a very mean thing for us not to yield up that to the public benefit which we must yield up to fate? And this discourse have I made, upon the supposition that those who at first attempt to go upon this wall must needs be killed in the attempt, though still men of true courage have a chance to escape even in the most hazardous undertakings. For in the first place, that part of the former wall that is thrown down is easily to be ascended, and for the new-built wall it is easily destroyed. Do you, therefore, many of you, pull up your courage and set about this work, and do you mutually encourage and assist one another, and this your bravery will soon break the hearts of your enemies, and perhaps such a glorious undertaking as yours is may be accomplished without bloodshed. For although it is justly to be supposed that the Jews will try to hinder you at your first beginning to go up to them, yet when you have once concealed yourselves from them, and driven them away by force, they will not be able to sustain your efforts against them any longer, though but a few of you prevent them, and get over the wall. As for that person who first mounts the wall, I should blush for shame if I did not make him to be envied of others, by those rewards I would bestow upon him. If such a one escape with his life, he shall have the command of others that are now but his equals, although it be true also that the greatest rewards will accrue to such as die in the attempt. 6. Upon this speech of Titus, the rest of the multitude were affrighted at so great a danger. But there was one whose name was Sabinus, a soldier that served among the cohorts, an Assyrian by birth who appeared to be of very great fortitude, both in the actions he had done, and the courage of his soul he had shown, although any body would have thought, before he came to his work, that he was of such a weak constitution of body, that he was not fit to be a soldier. For his color was black, his flesh was lean and thin, and lay close together. But there was a certain heroic soul that dwelt in this small body, which body was indeed much too narrow for that peculiar courage which was in him. Accordingly he was the first that rose up, when he thus spake, I readily surrender up myself to thee, O Caesar. I first ascend the wall, and I heartily wish that my fortune may follow my courage and my resolution. And if some ill fortune grudge me the success of my undertaking, take notice that my ill success will not be unexpected, but that I choose death voluntarily for thy sake. When he had said this, and had spread out his shield over his head with his left hand, with his right hand drawn his sword, he marched up to the wall just about the sixth hour of the day. There followed him eleven others, and no more, that resolved to imitate his bravery. 
but still this was the principal person of them all, and went first, as excited by a divine fury. Now those that guarded the wall shot at them from thence, and cast innumerable darts upon them from every side. They also rolled very large stones upon them, which overthrew some of those eleven that were with him. But as for Sabinus himself, he met the darts that were cast at him, and though he was overwhelmed with them, yet did he not leave off the violence of his attack before he had gotten up on the top of the wall, and had put the enemy to flight. For as the Jews were astonished at his great strength and the bravery of his soul, and as withal they imagined more of them had got upon the wall than really had, they were put to flight. And now one cannot but complain here of fortune, as still envious at virtue, and always hindering the performance of glorious achievements. This was the case of the man before us, when he had just obtained his purpose, for he then stumbled at a certain large stone, and fell down upon it headlong with a very great noise, upon which the Jews turned back, and when they saw him to be alone, and fallen down also, they threw darts at him from every side. However, he got upon his knee, and covered himself with his shield, and at the first defended himself against them, and wounded many of those that came near him. But he was soon forced to relax his right hand, by the multitude of the wounds that had been given him, till at length he was quite covered over with darts before he gave up the ghost. He was one who deserved a better fate, by reason of his bravery, but, as might be expected, he fell under so vast an attempt. As for the rest of his partners, the Jews dashed three of them to pieces with stones, and slew them as they were gotten up to the top of the wall. The other eight, being wounded, were pulled down and carried back to the camp. These things were done upon the third day of the month Panemus, Tammuz. 7. Now two days afterward, twelve of those men that were on the forefront and kept watch upon the banks got together, and called to them the standard-bearer of the fifth legion, and two others of a troop of horsemen, and one trumpeter. These went without noise, about the ninth hour of the night, through the ruins to the tower of Antonia. And when they had cut the throats of the first guards of the place, as they were asleep, they got possession of the wall, and ordered the trumpeter to sound his trumpet, upon which the rest of the guard got up on the sudden, and ran away before anybody could see how many they were that had gotten up, for, partly from the fear they were in, and partly from the sound of the trumpet which they heard, they imagined a great number of the enemy were gotten up. But as soon as Caesar heard the signal, he ordered the army to put on their armor immediately, and come thither with his commanders, and first of all ascended, as did the chosen men that were with him. And as the Jews were flying away to the temple, they fell into that mine which John had dug under the Roman banks. Then did the seditious of both the bodies of the Jewish army, as well that belonging to John as that belonging to Simon, drive them away, and indeed were no way wanting as to the highest degree of force and alacrity, for they esteemed themselves entirely ruined if once the Romans got into the temple as did the Romans look upon the same thing as the beginning of their entire conquest. So a terrible battle was fought at the entrance of the temple, while the Romans were forcing their way, in order to get possession of that temple, and the Jews were driving them back to the tower of Antonia, in which battle the darts were on both sides useless, as well as the spears, and both sides drew their swords and fought it out hand to hand. Now during the struggle, the positions of the men were undistinguished on both sides, and they fought at random, the men being intermixed one with another, and confounded by reason of the narrowness of the place, while the noise that was made fell on the ear after an indistinct manner, because it was so very loud. Great slaughter was now made on both sides, and the combatants trod upon the bodies and the armor of those that were dead, and dashed them to pieces. Accordingly, to which side soever the battle inclined, those that had the advantage exhorted one another to go on, as did those that were beaten make great lamentation. But still there was no room for flight, nor for pursuit, but disorderly revolutions and retreats, while the armies were intermixed one with another, 
but those that were in the first ranks were under the necessity of killing or being killed, without any way of escaping, for those on both sides that came behind forced those before them to go on, without leaving any space between the armies. At length the Jews' violent zeal was too hard for the Romans' skill, and the battle already inclined entirely that way, for the fight had lasted from the ninth hour of the night till the seventh hour of the day. While the Jews came on in crowds, and had the danger the temple was in for their motive, the Romans having no more here than a part of their army, for those legions, on which the soldiers on that side depended, were not come up to them. So it was at present thought sufficient by the Romans to take possession of the Tower of Antonia. 8. But there was one Julian, a centurion, that came from Ithinia, a man he was of great reputation, whom I had formerly seen in that war, and one of the highest fame, both for his skill in war, his strength of body, and the courage of his soul. This man, seeing the Romans giving ground, and ill a sad condition, for he stood by Titus at the Tower of Antonia, leaped out, and of himself alone put the Jews to flight, when they were already conquerors, and made them retire as far as the corner of the inner court of the temple. From him the multitude fled away in crowds, as supposing that neither his strength nor his violent attacks could be those of a mere man. Accordingly, he rushed through the midst of the Jews, as they were dispersed all abroad, and killed those that he caught. Nor, indeed, was there any sight that appeared more wonderful in the eyes of Caesar, or more terrible to others, than this. However, he was himself pursued by fate, which is not at all possible that he, who was but a mortal man, should escape. For as he had shoes all full of thick and sharp nails, as had every one of the other soldiers, so when he ran on the pavement of the temple, he slipped and fell down upon his back with a very great noise, which was made by his armor. Footnote. No wonder that this Julian, who had so many nails in his shoes, slipped upon the pavement of the temple, which was smooth, and laid with marble of different colors. End footnote. This made those that were running away to turn back, whereupon those Romans that were in the tower of Antonia set up a great shout, as they were in fear for the man. But the Jews got about him in crowds, and struck at him with their spears and with their swords on all sides. Now he received a great many of the strokes of these iron weapons upon his shield, and often attempted to get up again, but was thrown down by those that struck at him. Yet did he, as he lay along, stab many of them with his sword. Nor was he soon killed, as being covered with his helmet and his breastplate in all those parts of the body where he might be mortally wounded. He also pulled his neck close to his body, till all his other limbs were shattered, and nobody durst come to defend him, and then he yielded to his fate. Now Caesar was deeply affected on account of this man of so great fortitude, and especially as he was killed in the sight of so many people. He was desirous himself to come to his assistance, but the place would not give him leave, while such as could have done it were too much terrified to attempt it. Thus when Julian had struggled with death a great while, and had let but few of those that had given him his mortal wound go off unhurt, he had at last his throat cut, though not without some difficulty, and left behind him a very great fame, not only among the Romans and with Caesar himself, but among his enemies also. Then did the Jews catch up his dead body, and put the Romans to flight again, and shut them up in the tower of Antonia. Now those that most signalized themselves, and fought most zealously in this battle of the Jewish side, were one Alexis and Glyphius of John's party, and of Simon's party were Malachias, and Judas the son of Myrto, and James the son of Sosas, the commander of the Idumeans, and of the zealots two brethren, Simon and Judas, the sons of Jairus. End of Book 6, Chapter 1 Book 6, Chapter 2 of The Wars of the Jews This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Anne Boulay The Wars of the Jews by Josephus Translated by William Whiston. Chapter 2. 
how Titus gave orders to demolish the Tower of Antonia, and then persuaded Josephus to exhort the Jews again to a surrender. 1. And now Titus gave orders to his soldiers that were with him to dig up the foundations of the Tower of Antonia, and make him a ready passage for his army to come up, while he himself had Josephus brought to him. For he had been informed that on that very day, which was the seventeenth day of Panamus, Tamus, the sacrifice called the daily sacrifice had failed, and had not been offered to God, for want of men to offer it, and that the people were grievously troubled at it. Footnote. This was a remarkable day indeed, the seventeenth of Panamus, Tamus, A.D. 70, when, according to Daniel's prediction, six hundred and six years before, the Romans in half a week caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Daniel 9, verse 27. For, from the month of February, A.D. 66, about which time Vespasian entered on this war, to this very time, was just three years and a half. See Bishop Lloyd's Tables of Chronology, published by Mr. Marshall on this year. Nor is it to be omitted, what year nearly confirms this duration of the war, that four years before the war begun, was somewhat above seven years five months before the destruction of Jerusalem. End footnote and commanded him to say the same things to John that he had said before, that if he had any malicious inclination for fighting, he might come out with as many of his men as he pleased, in order to fight, without the danger of destroying either his city or temple, but that he desired he would not defile the temple, nor thereby offend against God, that he might, if he pleased, offer the sacrifices which were now discontinued by any of the Jews whom he should pitch upon. Upon this Josephus stood in such a place where he might be heard, not by John only, but by many more, and then declared to them what Caesar had given him in charge, and this in the Hebrew language. Footnote. The same that in the New Testament is always so called, and was then the common language of the Jews in Judea, which was the Syriac dialect. End footnote. So he earnestly prayed them to spare their own city, and to prevent that fire which was just ready to seize upon the temple, and to offer their usual sacrifices to God therein. At these words of his, a great sadness and silence were observed among the people. But the tyrant himself cast many reproaches upon Josephus, with imprecations besides. And at last added this withal, that he did never fear the taking of the city, because it was God's own city. In answer to which Josephus said thus with a loud voice, To be sure thou hast kept this city wonderfully pure for God's sake, the temple also continues entirely unpolluted, nor hast thou been guilty of ally and piety against him for whose assistance thou hopest. He still receives his accustomed sacrifices, vile wretch that thou art. If any one should deprive thee of thy daily food, thou wouldst esteem him to be an enemy to thee. But thou hopest to have that God for thy supporter in this war whom thou hast deprived of his everlasting worship. And thou impurest those sins to the Romans, who to this very time take care to have our laws observed, and almost compel these sacrifices to be still offered to God, which have by thy means been intermitted. Who is there that can avoid groans and lamentations at the amazing change that is made in this city? since very foreigners and enemies do now correct that impiety, which thou hast occasioned, while thou, who art a Jew, and wast educated in our laws, art become a greater enemy to them than the others. But still, John, it is never dishonorable to repent, and amend what hath been done amiss, even at the last extremity. Thou hast an instance before thee in Jaconia, the king of the Jews. Footnote. Our present copies of the Old Testament want this iconium upon king jeconia or jehoiakim which it seems was in josephus's copy End footnote. if thou hast a mind to save the city who when the king of babylon made war against him did of his own accord to go out of the city before it was taken and did undergo involuntary captivity with his family that the sanctuary might be delivered up to the enemy and that he might not see the house of god set on fire on which account he is celebrated among all the jews in their sacred memorials, and his memory is become immortal, and will be conveyed fresh down to our posterity through all ages. This, John, is an excellent example in such a time of danger, and I dare venture to promise that the Romans shall still forgive thee. And take notice that I, who make this exhortation to thee, 
and one of thine own nation, I, who am a Jew, do make this promise to thee, and it will become thee to consider who I am that give thee this counsel, and whence I am derived. For while I am alive I shall never be in such slavery, as to forego my own kindred, or forget the laws of our forefathers. Thou hast indignation at me again, and makest a clamor at me, and reproachest me. Indeed, I cannot deny, but I am worthy of worse treatment than all this amounts to, because, in opposition to fate, I make this kind invitation to thee, and endeavor to force deliverance upon those whom God hath condemned. And who is there that does not know what the writings of the ancient prophets contain in them, and particularly that oracle which is just now going to be fulfilled upon this miserable city? For they foretold that this city should be taken, when someone shall begin the slaughter of his own countrymen. And are not both the city and the entire temple now full of the dead bodies of your countrymen? It is God, therefore. It is God himself who is bringing on this fire to purge that city and temple by means of the Romans, and is going to pluck up this city, which is full of your pollutions. Footnote. Josephus, both here and in many places elsewhere, speaks so, that it is most evident he was fully satisfied that God was on the Roman side, and made use of them now for the destruction of that wicked nation of the Jews, which was for certain the true state of this matter, as the prophet Daniel first, and our Savior himself afterwards, had clearly foretold. End footnote. 2. As Josephus spoke these words, with groans and tears in his eyes, his voice was intercepted by sobs. However, the Romans could not but pity the affliction he was under, and wonder at his conduct. But for John, and those that were with him, they were but the more exasperated against the Romans on this account, and were desirous to get Josephus also into their power. Yet did that discourse influence a great many of the better sort, and truly some of them were so afraid of the guards set by the seditious, that they tarried where they were, but still were satisfied that both they and the city were doomed to destruction. Some also there were who, watching a proper opportunity when they might quietly get away, fled to the Romans, of whom were the high priests Joseph and Jesus, and of the sons of the high priests three, whose father was Ishmael, was beheaded in Cyrene, and four sons of Matthias, as also one son of the other Matthias, who ran away after his father's death. Footnote. Josephus had told us before, that this fourth son of Matthias ran away to the Romans before his father's and brethren's slaughter, and not after it, as here. The former account is, in all probability, the truest, for had not that fourth son escaped before the others were caught and put to death, he had been caught and put to death with them. This last account, therefore, looks like an instance of a small inadvertence of Josephus in the place before us. End footnote. And whose father was slain by Simon the son of Giorus, with three of his sons, as I have already related. Many also of the other nobility went over to the Romans, together with the high priests. Now Caesar not only received these men very kindly in other respects, but, knowing they would not willingly live after the customs of other nations, he sent them to Gophna, and desired them to remain there for the present, and told them, that when he was gotten clear of this war, he would restore each of them to their possessions again. So they cheerfully retired to that small city which was allotted them, without fear of any danger. But as they did not appear, the seditious gave out again that these deserters were slain by the Romans, which was done in order to deter the rest from running away, by fear of the like treatment. This trick of theirs succeeded now for a while, as did the like trick before, for the rest were hereby deterred from deserting, by fear of the like treatment. 3. However, when Titus had recalled those men from Gophna, he gave orders that they should go round the wall, together with Josephus, and show themselves to the people, upon which a great many fled to the Romans. These men also got in a great number together, and stood before the Romans, and besought the seditious, with groans and tears in their eyes, in the first place to receive the Romans entirely into the city, and save that their own place of residence again. But that, if they would not agree to such a proposal, they would at least depart out of the temple, and save the holy house for their own use, for that the Romans would not venture to set the sanctuary on fire but under the most pressing necessity. Yet did the seditious still more and more contradict them, and while they cast loud and bitter reproaches upon these deserters, 
they also set their engines for throwing of darts and javelins and stones upon the sacred gates of the temple at due distances from one another insomuch that all the space round about within the temple might be compared to a burying ground so great was the number of the dead bodies therein as might the holy house itself be compared to a citadel accordingly these men rushed upon these holy places in their armor that were otherwise unapproachable and that while their hands were yet warm with the blood of their own people which they had shed nay they proceeded to such great transgressions that the very same indignation which jews would naturally have against romans had they been guilty of such abuses against them the romans now had against the jews for their impiety in regard to their own religious customs nay indeed there were none of the roman soldiers who did not look with a sacred horror upon the holy house and adored it and wished that the robbers would repent before their miseries became incurable four now titus was deeply affected with this state of things and reproached john and his party and said to them have not you vile wretches that you are by our permission put up this partition wall before your sanctuary have not you been allowed to put up the pillars thereto belonging at due distances and on it to engrave in greek and in your own letters this prohibition that no foreigner should go beyond this wall footnote of this partition wall separating jews and gentiles with its pillars and inscription see the description of temples chapter fifteen and footnote have not we given you leave to kill such as go beyond it though he were a roman and what do you do now you pernicious villains why do you trample upon dead bodies in this temple and why do you pollute this holy house with the blood of both foreigners and jews themselves i appeal to the gods of my own country and to every god that ever had any regard to this place for i do not suppose it to be now regarded by any of them i also appeal to my own army and to those jews that are now with me and even to yourselves that i do not force you to defile this your sanctuary and if you will but change the place whereon you will fight no roman shall either come near your sanctuary or offer any affront to it nay i will endeavor to preserve your holy house whether you will or not footnote that these seditious jews were the direct occasions of their own destruction and the conflagration of their city and temple and that titus earnestly and constantly labored to save both is here and everywhere most evident in josephus and footnote five as Josephus explained these things from the mouth of Caesar, both the robbers and the tyrant thought these exhortations proceeded from Titus's fear, and not from his good will to them, and grew insolent upon it. But when Titus saw that these men were neither to be moved by commiseration towards themselves, nor had any concern upon them to have the holy house spared, he proceeded unwillingly to go on again with the war against them. He could not indeed bring all his army against them, the place was so narrow but choosing thirty soldiers of the most valiant out of every hundred and committing a thousand to each tribune and making Cerealis their commander-in-chief he gave orders that they should attack the guards of the temple about the ninth hour of that night but as he was now in his armor and preparing to go down with them his friends would not let him go by reason of the greatness of the danger and what the commanders suggested to them for they said he would do more by sitting above in the tower of antonia as a dispenser of rewards to those soldiers that signalized themselves in the fight than by going down and hazarding his own person in the forefront of them for that they would all fight stoutly while caesar looked upon them with this advice caesar complied and said that the only reason he had for such compliance with the soldiers was this that he might be able to judge their courageous actions and that no valiant soldier might lie concealed and miss his reward and no cowardly soldier might go unpunished but that he might himself be an eyewitness and able to give evidence of all that was done who was to be the disposer of punishments and rewards to them so he sent the soldiers about their work at the hour forementioned while he went out himself to a higher place in the tower of antonia whence he might see what was done and there waited with impatience to see the event six however the soldiers that were sent did not find the guards of the temple asleep as they hoped to have done but were obliged to fight with them immediately hand to hand as they rushed with violence upon them with a great shout now as soon as the rest within the temple heard that shout of those that were upon the watch they ran out in troops upon them 
Then did the Romans receive the onset of those that came first upon them, but those that followed them fell upon their own troops, and many of them treated their own soldiers as if they had been the enemies. For the great confused noise that was made on both sides hindered them from distinguishing one another's voices, as did the darkness of the night hinder them from the like distinction by the sight, besides that blindness which arose otherwise also from the passion and the fear they were in at the same time, for which reason it was all one to the soldiers who it was they struck at. However, this ignorance did less harm to the Romans than to the Jews, because they were joined together under their shields, and made their sallies more regularly than the others did, and each of them remembered their watchword, while the Jews were perpetually dispersed abroad, and made their attacks and retreats at random, and so did frequently seem to one another to be enemies. For every one of them received those of their own men that came back in the dark as Romans, and made an assault upon them, so that more of them were wounded by their own men than by the enemy, till, upon the coming of the day, the nature of the right was discerned by the eye afterward. Then did they stand in battle array in distinct bodies, and cast their darts regularly, and regularly defended themselves, nor did either side yield or grow weary. The Romans contended with each other who should fight the most strenuously, both single men and entire regiments, as being under the eye of Titus, and every one concluded that this day would begin his promotion if he fought bravely. What were the great encouragements of the Jews to act vigorously were, their fear for themselves and for their temple, and the presence of their tyrant, who exhorted some, and beat and threatened others, to act courageously. Now, so it happened, that this fight was for the most part a stationary one, wherein the soldiers went on and came back in a short time, and suddenly, for there was no long space of ground for either of their fights or pursuits. But still there was a tumultuous noise among the Romans from the tower of Antonia, who loudly cried out upon all occasions to their own men to press on courageously, when they were too hard for the Jews, and to stay when they were retiring backward so that here was a kind of theater of war, for what was done in this fight could not be concealed either from Titus or from those that were about him. At length it appeared that this fight, which began at the ninth hour of the night, was not over till past the fifth hour of the day, and that, in the same place where the battle began, neither party could say they had made the other to retire, but both armies left the victory almost in uncertainty between them, wherein those that signalized themselves on the Roman side were a great many, but on the Jewish side, and of those that were with Simon, Judas the son of Myrto, and Simon the son of Joseph, of the Idumeans, James and Simon, the latter of whom was the son of Cathlos, and James was the son of Sosas, of those that were with John, Giphtheus and Alexis, and of the zealots, Simon the son of Jairus. 7. In the meantime, the rest of the Roman army had, in seven days' time, overthrown some foundations of the tower of Antonia, and had made a ready and broad way to the temple. Then did the legions come near the first court, footnote, court of the Gentiles, and footnote, and began to raise their banks. The one bank was over against the northwest corner of the inner temple, footnote, court of Israel, and footnote. Another was at that northern edifice which was between the two gates, and the other two, one was at the western cloister of the outer court of the temple, the other against its northern cloister. However, these works were thus far advanced by the Romans, not without great pains and difficulty, and particularly being obliged to bring their materials from the distance of a hundred furlongs. They had further difficulties also upon them, sometimes by their over-great security they were in, that they should overcome the Jewish snares laid for them, and by that boldness of the Jews, which their despair of escaping had inspired them withal. For some of their horsemen, when they went out to gather wood or hay, let their horses feed without having their bridles on during the time of foraging, upon which horses the Jews sallied out in whole bodies and seized them. When this was continually done, and Caesar believed what the truth was, that the horses were stolen more by the negligence of his own men than by the valor of the Jews, he determined to use greater severity to oblige the rest to take care of their horses. So he commanded that one of those soldiers who had lost their horses should be capitally punished, whereby he so terrified the rest that they preserved their horses for the time to come, for they did not any longer let them go from them to feed by themselves, but, as if they had grown to them, they went always along with them when they wanted necessaries. 
thus did the romans still continue to make war against the temple and to raise their banks against it eight now after one day had been interposed since the romans ascended the breach many of the seditious were so pressed by the famine upon the present failure of their ravages that they got together and made an attack on those roman guards that were upon the mount of olives and this about the eleventh hour of the day as supposing first that they would not expect such an onset and in the next place that they were then taking care of their bodies and that therefore they should easily beat them but the romans were apprised of their coming to attack them beforehand and running together from the neighboring camps on the sudden prevented them from getting over their fortification or forcing the wall that was built about them upon this came a sharp fight and here many great actions were performed on both sides while the romans showed both their courage and their skill in war as did the jews come on them with immoderate violence and intolerable passion the one part were urged on by shame and the other by necessity for it seemed a very shameful thing to the romans to let the jews go now they were taken in a kind of net while the jews had but one hope of saving themselves and that was in case they could by violence break through the roman wall and one whose name was pedanius belonging to the party of horsemen when the jews were already beaten and forced down into the valley together spurred his horse on their flank with great vehemence and caught up a certain young man belonging to the enemy by his ankle as he was running away the man was however of a robust body and in his armor so low did pandanius bend himself downward from his horse even as he was galloping away and so great was the strength of his right hand and of the rest of his body as also such skill had he in horsemanship so this man seized upon that his prey as upon a precious treasure and carried him as his captive to caesar whereupon titus admired the man that had seized the other for his great strength and ordered the man that was caught to be punished with death for his attempt against the roman wall but betook himself to the siege of the temple and to pressing on the raising of the banks nine in the meantime the jews were so distressed by the fights they had been in as the war advanced higher and higher and creeping up to the holy house itself that they as it were cut off those limbs of their body which were infected in order to prevent the distemper spreading further for they set the northwest cloister which was joined to the tower of antonia on fire and after that break off about twenty cubits of that cloister and thereby made a beginning in burning the sanctuary two days after which or on the twenty-fourth day of the forenamed month panemus or tamus the romans set fire to the cloister that joined to the other when the fire went fifteen cubits farther the jews in like manner cut off its roof nor did they entirely leave off what they were about till the tower of antonia was parted from the temple even when it was in their power to have stopped the fire nay they lay still while the temple was first set on fire and deemed this spreading of the fire to be for their own advantage however the armies were still fighting one against another about the temple and the war was managed by continual sallies of particular parties against one another ten now there was at this time a man among the jews low of stature he was and of a despicable appearance of no character either as to his family or in other respects his name was jonathan he went out at the high priest john's monument and uttered many other insolent things to the romans and challenged the best of them all to a single combat but many of those that stood there in the army huffed him and many of them as they might well be were afraid of him some of them also reasoned thus and that justly enough that it was not fit to fight with a man that desired to die because those that utterly despaired of deliverance had besides other passions a violence in attacking men that could not be opposed and had no regard to god himself and that to hazard oneself with a person whom if you overcome you do no great matter and by whom it is hazardous that you may be taken prisoner would be an instance not of manly courage but of unmanly rashness so there being nobody that came out to accept the man's challenge and the jew cutting them with a great number of reproaches as cowards for he was a very haughty man in himself and a great despiser of the romans one whose name was pudens of the body of horsemen out of his abomination of the other's words and of his impudence withal and perhaps out of an inconsiderate arrogance on account of the other's lowness of stature ran out to him and was too hard for him in other respects but was betrayed by his ill fortune for he fell down and as he was down jonathan came running to him and cut his throat 
and then, standing upon his dead body, he brandished his sword, bloody as it was, and shook his shield with his left hand, and made many acclamations to the Roman army, and exulted over the dead man, and jested upon the Romans. Till at length one Priscus, a centurion, shot a dart at him as he was leaping and playing the fool with himself, and thereby pierced him through, upon which a shout was set up both by the Jews and the Romans, though on different accounts. So Jonathan grew giddy by the pain of his wounds, and fell down upon the body of his adversary, as a plain instance how suddenly vengeance may come upon men that have success in war, without any just deserving the same. End of Book 6, Chapter 2 Book 6, Chapter 3 of The Wars of the Jews Recording by Anne Boulay The Wars of the Jews by Josephus Translated by William Whiston Chapter 3 Concerning a stratagem that was devised by the Jews, by which they burnt many of the Romans, with another description of the terrible famine that was in the city. 1. But now the seditious that were in the temple did every day openly endeavor to beat off the soldiers that were upon the banks. And on the twenty-seventh day of the forenamed month, Panamus, or Tamus, contrived such a stratagem as this. They filled that part of the western cloister which was between the beams, footnote, of the court of the Gentiles, and footnote, and the roof under them, with dry materials, as also with bitumen and pitch, and then retired from that place, as though they were tired with the pains they had taken, at which procedure of theirs, many of the most inconsiderate among the Romans, who were carried away with violent passions, followed hard after them as they were retiring, and applied ladders to the cloister, and got up to it suddenly. But the prudent part of them, when they understood this unaccountable retreat of the Jews, stood still where they were before. However, the cloister was full of those that were gone up the ladders, at which time the Jews set it all on fire. And as the flame burst out everywhere on a sudden, the Romans that were out of the danger were seized with a very great consternation, as were those that were in the midst of the danger in the utmost distress. So when they perceived themselves surrounded with the flames, some of them threw themselves down backwards into the city, and some among their enemies in the temple, as did many leap down to their own men, and broke their limbs to pieces. But a great number of those that were going to take these violent methods were prevented by the fire, though some prevented the fire by their own swords. However, the fire was on the sudden carried so far as to surround those who would have otherwise perished. As for Caesar himself, he could not, however, but commiserate those that thus perished, although they got up thither without any order for doing so, since there was no way of giving them any relief. Yet was this comfort to those that were destroyed, that every body might see that person grieve, for whose sake they came to their end. For he cried out openly to them and leaped up, and exhorted those that were about him to do their utmost to relieve them. So every one of them died cheerfully, as carrying along with him these words and this intention of Caesar as a sepulchral monument. Some there were indeed who retired into the wall of the cloister, which was broad, and were preserved out of the fire, but were then surrounded by the Jews, and although they made resistance against the Jews for a long time, yet were they wounded by them, and at length they all fell down dead. 2. At the last a young man among them, whose name was Longus, became a decoration of this sad affair, and while every one of them that perished were worthy of a memorial, this man appeared to deserve it beyond all the rest. Now the Jews admired this man for his courage, and were further desirous of having him slain, so they persuaded him to come down to them, upon security given him for his life. But Cornelius his brother persuaded him on the contrary, not to tarnish his own glory, nor that of the Roman army. He complied with this last advice, and lifting up his sword before both armies, he slew himself. Yet there was one Artorius among those surrounded by the fire who escaped by his subtlety. For when he had with a loud voice called to him Lucius, one of his fellow soldiers that laid with him in the same tent, and said to him, I do leave thee heir of all I have, if thou wilt come and receive me. Upon this he came running to receive him readily. 
Artorius then threw himself down upon him, and saved his own life, while he that received him was dashed so vehemently against the stone pavement by the other's weight, that he died immediately. This melancholy accident made the Romans sad for a while, but still it made them more upon their guard for the future, and was of advantage to them against the delusions of the Jews, by which they were greatly damaged through their unacquaintedness with the places, and with the nature of the inhabitants. Now this cloister was burnt down as far as John's tower, which he built in the war he made against Simon over the gates that led to the Zistus. The Jews also cut off the rest of that cloister from the temple, after they had destroyed those that got up to it. But the next day the Romans burnt down the northern cloister entirely, as far as the east cloister, whose common angle joined to the valley that was called Cedron, and was built over it, on which account the depth was frightful, and this was the state of the temple at that time. 3. Now of those that perished by famine in the city, the number was prodigious, and the miseries they underwent were unspeakable. For if so much as the shadow of any kind of food did anywhere appear, a war was commenced presently, and the dearest friends fell a-fighting one with another about it, snatching from each other the most miserable supports of life. Nor would men believe that those who were dying had no food, but the robbers would search them when they were expiring, lest any one should have concealed food in their bosoms, and counterfeited dying. Nay, these robbers gaped for want, and ran about stumbling and staggering along like mad dogs, and reeling against the doors of the men like drunken men. They would also, in the great distress they were in, rush into the very same houses two or three times in one and the same day. Moreover, their hunger was so intolerable that it obliged them to chew everything, while they gathered such things as the most sordid animals would not touch, and endured to eat them. Nor did they at length abstain from girdles and shoes, and the very leather which belonged to their shields they pulled off and gnawed. The very wisps of old hay became food to some, and some gathered up fibers, and sold a very small weight of them for four attic drachmae. But why do I describe the shameless impudence that the famine brought on men in eating their inanimate objects, while I am going to relate a matter of fact, the like to which no history relates, either among the Greeks or barbarians? Footnote. What Josephus observes here, that no parallel examples had been recorded before this time of such sieges, wherein mothers were forced by extremity of famine to eat their own children, as had been threatened to the Jews in the law of Moses upon abstinent disobedience, and more than once fulfilled, is, by Dr. Hudson, supposed to have had two or three parallel examples in later ages. He might have had more examples, I suppose, of persons on shipboard, or in a desert island, casting lots for each other's bodies. But all this was only in cases where they knew of no possible way to avoid death themselves but by killing and eating others. Whether such examples come up to the present case may be doubted. The Romans were not only willing, but very desirous to grant those Jews in Jerusalem both their lives and their liberties, and to save both their city and their temple. But the zealots, the robbers, and the seditious would hearken to no terms of submission. They voluntarily chose to reduce the citizens to that extremity, as to force mothers to this unnatural barbarity, which, in all its circumstances, has not, I still suppose, been hitherto paralleled among the rest of mankind. End footnote. It is horrible to speak of, and incredible when heard. I had indeed willingly omitted this calamity of ours, that I might not seem to deliver what is so portentous to posterity, but that I have innumerable witnesses to it in my own age. And besides, my country would have had little reason to thank me for suppressing the miseries that she underwent at this time. 4. There was a certain woman that dwelt beyond Jordan, her name was Mary. Her father was Eleazar, of the village Bethazob, which signifies the house of Hysop. She was eminent for her family and her wealth, and had fled away to Jerusalem with the rest of the multitude, and was with them besieged therein at this time. The other effects of this woman had been already seized upon, such I mean as she had brought with her out of Perea, and removed to the city. What she had treasured up besides, as also what food she had contrived to save, had also been carried off by the rapacious guards, who came every day running into her house for that purpose. This put the poor woman into a very great passion, and by the frequent reproaches and imprecations she eased at these rapacious villains, 
she had provoked them to anger against her but none of them either out of the indignation she had raised against herself or out of commiseration of her case would take away her life and if she found any food she perceived her labors were for others and not for herself and it was now become impossible for her anyway to find any more food while the famine pierced through her very bowels and marrow when also her passion was fired to a degree beyond the famine itself nor did she consult with anything but with her passion and the necessity she was in she then attempted a most unnatural thing and snatching up her son who was a child sucking at her breast she said o thou miserable infant for whom shall i preserve thee in this war this famine and this sedition as to the war with the romans if they preserve our lives we must be slaves this famine also will destroy us even before that slavery comes upon us yet are these seditious rogues more terrible than both the other come on be thou my food and be thou a fury to these seditious varlets and a byword to the world which is all that is now wanting to complete the calamities of us jews as soon as she had said this she slew her son and then roasted him and eat the one half of him and kept the other half by her concealed upon this the seditious came in presently and smelling the horrid scent of this food they threatened her that they would cut her throat immediately if she did not show them what food she had gotten ready she replied that she had saved a very fine portion of it for them and withal uncovered what was left of her son hereupon they seized with a horror and amazement of mind and stood astonished at the sight when she said to them this is mine own son and what hath been done was mine own doing come eat this food for i have eaten of it myself do not you pretend to be either more tender than a woman or more compassionate than a mother but if you be so scrupulous and do abominate this my sacrifice as i have eaten the one half let the rest be reserved for me also after which those men went out trembling being never so much affrighted at anything as they were at this and with some difficulty they left the rest of that meat to the mother upon which the whole city was full of this horrid action immediately and while everybody laid this miserable case before their own eyes they trembled as if this unheard of action had been done by themselves so those that were thus distressed by the famine were very desirous to die and those already dead were esteemed happy because they had not lived long enough either to hear or to see such miseries five this sad instance was quickly told to the romans some of whom could not believe it and others pitied the distress which the jews were under but there were many of them who were hereby induced to a more bitter hatred than ordinary against our nation but for caesar he excused himself before god as to this matter and said that he had proposed peace and liberty to the jews as well as an oblivion of all their former insolent practices but that they instead of concord had chosen sedition instead of peace war and before satiety and abundance a famine that they had begun with their own hands to burn down that temple which we have preserved hitherto and that therefore they deserved to eat such food as was this that however this horrid action of eating an own child ought to be covered with the overthrow of their very own country itself and that men ought not to leave such a city upon the habitable earth to be seen by the sun wherein mothers are thus fed although such food be fitter for the fathers than for the mothers to eat of since it is they that continue still in a state of war against us after they have undergone such miseries as these and at the same time that he said this he reflected on the desperate condition these men must be in nor could he expect that such men could be recovered to sobriety of mind after they had endured those very sufferings for the avoiding thereof it only was probable they might have repented end of book six chapter three book six chapter four of the wars of the jews this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain the wars of the jews by josephus translated by william whiston chapter four when the banks were completed and the battering rams brought and could do nothing Titus gave orders to set fire to the gates of the temple, in no long time after which the holy house itself was burnt down, even against his consent. 1. 
and now two of the legions had completed their banks on the eighth day of the month Luz, Ab, whereupon Titus gave orders that the battering rams should be brought, and set over against the western edifice of the inner temple. For before these were brought, the firmest of all the other engines had battered the wall for six days together without ceasing, without making any impression upon it. But the vast largeness and strong connection of the stones were superior to that engine, and to the other battering rams also. Other Romans did indeed undermine the foundations of the northern gate, and after a world of pains removed the outermost stones, yet was the gate still upheld by the inner stones, and stood still unhurt, till the workmen, despairing of all such attempts by engines and crows, brought their ladders to the cloisters. Now the Jews did not interrupt them in so doing, but when they were gotten up, they fell upon them, and fought with them. Some of them they thrust down, and threw them backwards headlong. Others of them they met and slew. They also beat many of those that went down the ladders again, and slew them with their swords before they could bring their shields to protect them. Nay, some of the ladders they threw down from above when they were full of armed men. A great slaughter was made of the Jews also at the same time, while those that bear the ensigns fought hard for them, as deeming it a terrible thing, and what would tend to their great shame, if they permitted them to be stolen away. Yet did the Jews at length get possession of these engines, and destroyed those that had gone up the ladders, while the rest were so intimidated by what those suffered who were slain, that they retired, although none of the Romans died without having done good service before his death. Of the seditious, those that had fought bravely in the former battles did the like now, as besides them did Eleazar, the brother's son of Simon the tyrant. But when Titus perceived that his endeavors to spare a foreign temple turned to the damage of his soldiers, and then be killed, he gave order to set the gates on fire. 2. In the meantime there deserted to him Ananus, who came from Emmaus, the most bloody of all Simon's guards, and Archelaus, the son of Megadatus, they hoping to be still forgiven, because they left the Jews at a time when they were the conquerors. Titus objected this to these men as a cunning trick of theirs, and as he had been informed of their other barbarities towards the Jews, he was going in all haste to have them both slain. He told them that they were only driven to this desertion because of the utmost distress they were in, and did not come away of their own good disposition, and that those did not deserve to be preserved, by whom their own city was already set on fire, out of which fire they now hurried themselves away. However, the security he had promised deserters overcame his resentments, and he dismissed them accordingly, though he did not give them the same privileges that he had afforded to others. And now the soldiers had already put fire to the gates, and the silver that was over them quickly carried the flames to the wood that was within it, whence it spread itself all on the sudden, and caught hold on the cloisters. Upon the Jews seeing this fire all about them, their spirits sunk together with their bodies, and they were under such astonishment, that not one of them made any haste, either to defend himself or to quench the fire, but they stood as mute spectators of it only. However, they did not so grieve at the loss of what was now burning, as to grow wiser thereby for the time to come but as though the holy house itself had been on fire already, they wetted their passions against the Romans. This fire prevailed during that day and the next also, for the soldiers were not able to burn all the cloisters that were round about together at one time, but only by pieces. 3. But then, on the next day, Titus commanded part of his army to quench the fire, and to make a road for the more easy marching up of the legions, while he himself gathered the commanders together. Of those there were assembled the six principal persons, Tiberius Alexander, the commander, under the general, of the whole army, with Sextus Cerealis, the commander of the fifth legion, and Marcius Lepidus, the commander of the tenth legion, and Titus Phrygius, the commander of the fifteenth legion. There was also with them Eternius, the leader of the two legions that came from Alexandria, and Marcus Antonius Julianus, procurator of Judea. After these came together all the rest of the procurators and tribunes. 
Titus proposed to these that they should give him their advice what should be done about the holy house. Now some of these thought it would be the best way to act according to the rules of war and demolish it, because the Jews would never leave off rebelling while that house was standing, at which house it was that they used to get all together. Others of them were of opinion that in case the Jews would leave it, and none of them would lay their arms up in it, he might save it. But that in case they got upon it and fought any more, he might burn it, because it must then be looked upon not as a holy house, but as a citadel, and that the impiety of burning it would then belong to those that forced this to be done, and not to them. But Titus said that, although the Jews should get upon that holy house and fight us thence, yet ought we not to revenge ourselves on things that are inanimate, instead of the men themselves, and that he was not in any case for the burning down of so vast a work as that was, because it would be a mischief to the Romans themselves, as it would be an ornament to their government while it continued. So Fronto and Alexander and Cerealis grew bold upon that declaration, and agreed to the opinion of Titus. Then was this assembly dissolved, when Titus had given orders to the commanders that the rest of their forces should lie still, but that they should make use of such as were the most courageous in this attack. So he commanded that the chosen men that were taken out of the cohorts should make their way through the ruins and quench the fire. 4. Now it was true that on this day the Jews were so weary, and under such consternation, that they refrained from any attacks. But on the next day they gathered their whole force together, and ran upon those that guarded the outward court of the temple very boldly, through the east gate, and this about the second hour of the day. These guards received that their attack with great bravery, and by covering themselves with their shields before, as if it were with a wall, they drew their squadron close together. Yet was it evident that they could not abide there very long, but would be overborne by the multitude of those that sallied out upon them, and by the heat of their passion. However, Caesar seeing, from the tower of Antonia, that this squadron was likely to give way, he sent some chosen horsemen to support them, whereupon the Jews found themselves not able to sustain their onset, and upon the slaughter of those in the forefront, many of the rest were put to flight. But as the Romans were going off, the Jews turned upon them and fought them, and as those Romans came back upon them, they retreated again, until about the fifth hour of the day they were overborne, and shut themselves up in the inner court of the temple. 5. So Titus retired into the tower of Antonia, and resolved to storm the temple the next day, early in the morning, with his whole army, and to encamp round about the holy house. But as for that house, God had for certain, long ago doomed it to the fire, and now that fatal day was come, according to the revolution of ages. It was the tenth day of the month Luz, Ab, upon which it was formerly burnt by the king of Babylon, although these flames took their rise from the Jews themselves, and were occasioned by them. For upon Titus's retiring, the seditious lay still for a little while, and then attacked the Romans again, when those that guarded the holy house fought with those that quenched the fire that was burning the inner court of the temple. But these Romans put the Jews to flight, and proceeded as far as the holy house itself, at which time one of the soldiers, without staying for any orders, and without any concern or dread upon him at so great an undertaking, and being hurried on by a certain divine fury, snatched somewhat out of the materials that were on fire, and being lifted up by another soldier, he set fire to a golden window, through which there was a passage to the rooms that were round about the holy house, on the north side of it. As the flames went upward, the Jews made a great clamor, such as so mighty an affliction required, and ran together to prevent it. And now they spared not their lives any longer, nor suffered anything to restrain their force, since that holy house was perishing, for whose sake it was that they kept such a guard about it. 6. And now a certain person came running to Titus, and told him of this fire, as he was resting himself in his tent after the last battle, whereupon he rose up in great haste, and, as he was, ran to the holy house, in order to have a stop put to the fire. After him followed all his commanders, 
and after them followed the several legions in great astonishment, so there was a great clamor and tumult raised, as was natural upon the disorderly motion of so great an army. Then did Caesar, both by calling to the soldiers that were fighting, with a loud voice, and by giving a signal to them with his right hand, order them to quench the fire. But they did not hear what he said, though he spake so loud, having their ears already dimmed by a greater noise another way. Nor did they attend to the signal he made with his hand neither, as still some of them were distracted with fighting, and others with passion. But as for the legions that came running thither, neither any persuasions nor any threatenings could restrain their violence, but each one's own passion was his commander at this time. And as they were crowding into the temple together, many of them were trampled on by one another, while a great number fell among the ruins of the cloisters, which were still hot and smoking, and were destroyed in the same miserable way with those whom they had conquered. And when they were come near the holy house, they made as if they did not so much as hear Caesar's orders to the contrary, but they encouraged those that were before them to set it on fire. As for the seditious, they were in too great distress already to afford their assistance towards quenching the fire. They were everywhere slain and everywhere beaten, and as for the great part of the people, they were weak and without arms, and had their throats cut wherever they were caught." Now round about the altar lay dead bodies heaped one upon another, as at the steps going up to it ran a great quantity of their blood, whither also the dead bodies that were slain above on the altar fell down. Footnote. These steps to the altar of burnt offering seem here either an improper and inaccurate expression of Josephus, since it was unlawful to make ladder steps, or else those steps or stairs we now use were invented before the days of Herod the Great, and had been there built by him. Though the latter Jews always deny it, and say that even Herod's altar was ascended to by an acclivity only. And footnote. 7. And now, since Caesar was no way able to restrain the enthusiastic fury of the soldiers, and the fire proceeded on more and more, he went into the holy place of the temple with his commanders, and saw it, with what was in it, which he found to be far superior to what the relations of foreigners contained, and not inferior to what we ourselves boasted of, and believed about it. But as the flame had not as yet reached to its inward parts, but was still consuming the rooms that were about the holy house, and Titus supposing what the fact was, that the house itself might yet be saved, he came in haste and endeavored to persuade the soldiers to quench the fire, and gave order to Liberalius the centurion, and one of those spearmen that were about him, to beat the soldiers that were refractory with their staves, and to restrain them. Yet were their passions too hard for the regards they had for Caesar, and the dread they had of him who forbade them, as was their hatred of the Jews, and a certain vehement inclination to fight them, too hard for them also. Moreover, the hope of plunder induced many to go on, as having this opinion, that all the places within were full of money, and as seeing that all round about it was made of gold. And besides, one of those that went into the place prevented Caesar, when he ran so hastily out to restrain the soldiers, and threw the fire upon the hinges of the gate in the dark, whereby the flame burst out from within the holy house itself immediately, when the commanders retired and Caesar with them, and when nobody any longer forbade those that were without to set fire to it and thus was the holy house burnt down without Caesar's approbation. 8. Now although any one would justly lament the destruction of such a work as this was, since it was the most admirable of all the works that we have seen or heard of, both for its curious structure and its magnitude, and also for the vast wealth bestowed upon it, as well as for the glorious reputation it had for its holiness, yet might such a one comfort himself with this thought, that it was fate that decreed it so to be, which is inevitable, both as to living creatures and as to works and places also. However, one cannot but wonder at the accuracy of this period thereto relating, for the same month and day were now observed, as I said before, wherein the holy house was burnt formerly by the Babylonians. Now the number of years that passed from its first foundation, which was laid by King Solomon, till this its destruction, which happened in the second year of the reign of Vespasian, 
are collected to be one thousand one hundred and thirty, besides seven months and fifteen days. And from the second building of it, which was done by Haggai, in the second year of Cyrus the king, till its destruction under Vespasian, there were six hundred and thirty-nine years and forty-five days. End of Book 6, Chapter 4Book 6, Chapter 5 of The Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Wars of the Jews by Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Chapter 5 The Great Distress the Jews Were In Upon the Conflagration of the Holy House. Concerning a False Prophet and the Signs that Preceded This Destruction. 1. While the holy house was on fire, everything was plundered that came to hand, and ten thousand of those that were caught were slain. Nor was there a commiseration of any age, or any reverence of gravity, but children, and old men, and profane persons, and priests were all slain in the same manner, so that this war went round all sorts of men, and brought them to destruction, and as well those that made supplication for their lives, as those that defended themselves by fighting. The flame was also carried a long way, and made an echo, together with the groans of those that were slain. And because this hill was high, and the works of the temple were very great, one would have thought the whole city had been on fire. Nor can one imagine anything either greater or more terrible than this noise. For there was at once a shout of the Roman legions, who were marching all together, and a sad clamor of the seditious, who were now surrounded with fire and sword. The people also that were left above were beaten back upon the enemy, and under a great consternation, and made sad moans at the calamity they were under. The multitude also that was in the city joined in this outcry with those that were upon the hill. And besides, many of those that were worn away by the famine, and their mouths almost closed, when they saw the fire of the holy house, they exerted their utmost strength, and break out into groans and outcries again. Para did also return the echo, as well as the mountains round about the city, and augmented the force of the entire noise. Footnote. This Perea, if the word be not mistaken in the copies, cannot well be that Perea which was beyond Jordan, whose mountains were at a considerable distance from Jordan, and much too remote from Jerusalem to join in this echo at the conflagration of the temple. But Perea must be rather some mountains beyond the brook Kedron, as was the Mount of Olives, or some others about such a distance from Jerusalem, which observation is so obvious that it is a wonder our commentators here take no notice of it. And footnote. Yet was the misery itself more terrible than this disorder, for one would have thought that the hill itself, on which the temple stood, was seething hot, as full of fire on every part of it, that the blood was larger in quantity than the fire, and those that were slain were more in number than those that slew them. For the ground did nowhere appear visible for the dead bodies that lay on it, but the soldiers went over heaps of these bodies, as they ran upon such as fled from them. And now it was that the multitude of the robbers were thrust out of the inner court of the temple by the Romans, and had much ado to get into the outward court, and from thence into the city, while the remainder of the populace fled into the cloister of that outer court. As for the priests, some of them plucked up from the holy house the spikes that were upon it, with their bases, which were made of lead, and shot them at the Romans instead of darts. Footnote. Reland, I think, here judges well, when he interprets these spikes, of those that stood on the top of the holy house, with sharp points. They were fixed into lead, to prevent the birds from sitting there, and defiling the holy house. For such spikes there were now upon it, as Josephus himself hath already assured us. End footnote. But then as they gained nothing by so doing, and as the fire burst out upon them, they retired to the wall that was eight cubits broad, and there they tarried. Yet did two of these of eminence among them, who might have saved themselves by going over to the Romans, or have borne up with courage and taken their fortune with the others, throw themselves into the fire, and were burnt together with the holy house. Their names were Maris, the son of Belgus, and Joseph, the son of Dalius. 2. And now the Romans, judging that it was in vain to spare what was round about the holy house, 
burnt all those places, as also the remains of the cloisters and the gates, two excepted, the one on the east side and the other on the south, both which, however, they burnt afterward. They also burnt down the treasury chambers, in which was an immense quantity of money, and an immense number of garments, and other precious goods there reposited, and, to speak all in a few words, there it was that the entire riches of the Jews were heaped up together, while the rich people had there built themselves chambers to contain such furniture. The soldiers also came to the rest of the cloisters that were in the outer court of the temple, whither the women and children and a great mixed multitude of the people fled, in number about six thousand. But before Caesar had determined anything about these people, or given the commanders any orders relating to them, the soldiers were in such a rage that they set that cloister on fire, by which means it came to pass that some of these were destroyed by throwing themselves down headlong, and some were burnt in the cloisters themselves. Nor did any one of them escape with his life. A false prophet was the occasion of these people's destruction, who had made a public proclamation in the city that very day, that God commanded them to get upon the temple, and that there they should receive miraculous signs of their deliverance. Footnote. Reland here takes notice that these Jews who had despised the true prophet were deservedly abused and deluded by these false ones. End footnote. Now there was then a great number of false prophets suborned by the tyrants to impose on the people who denounced this to them that they should wait for deliverance from God, and this was in order to keep them from deserting and that they might be buoyed up above fear and care by such hopes. Now a man that is in adversity does easily comply with such promises, for when such a seducer makes him believe that he shall be delivered from these miseries which oppress him, then it is that the patient is full of hopes of such his deliverance. 3. Thus were the miserable people persuaded by these deceivers, and such as belied God himself, while they did not attend nor give credit to the signs that were so evident, and did so plainly foretell their future desolation, but, like men infatuated, without either eyes to see or minds to consider, did not regard the denunciations that God made to them. Thus there was a star resembling a sword, which stood over the city, and a comet that continued a whole year. Footnote. Whether Josephus means that this star was different from that comet which lasted a whole year, I cannot certainly determine. His words most favor their being different one from another. And footnote. Thus also before the Jews' rebellion, and before those commotions which preceded the war, when the people were come in great crowds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the eighth day of the month Xanthicus, Nisan, and at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone round the altar and the holy house, that it appeared to be bright daytime, which lasted for half an hour. Footnote. Since Josephus still uses the Syro-Macedonian month Xanthicus for the Jewish month Nisan, this eighth, or as Nicephorus reads it, this ninth of Xanthicus or Nisan, was almost a week before the Passover, on the fourteenth, about which time we learn from St. John that many used to go, quote, out of the country to Jerusalem to purify themselves, and quote, John 11, verse 55, with chapter 12, verse 1 in agreement with Josephus also, Book 5, Chapter 3, Section 1. And it might well be, that in the sight of these, this extraordinary light might appear. And footnote. This light seemed to be a good sign to the unskillful, but was so interpreted by the sacred scribes, as to portend those events that followed immediately upon it. At the same festival also, a heifer, as she was led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth a lamb in the midst of the temple. Moreover, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, footnote, this here seems to be the court of the priests, and footnote, which was of brass, and vastly heavy, and had been with difficulty shut by twenty men, and rested upon a basis armed with iron, and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, which was there made of one entire stone, was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night, now those that kept watch in the temple came here upon running to the captain of the temple, and told him of it, who then came up thither, and not without great difficulty was able to shut the gate again. This also appeared to the vulgar to be a very happy prodigy, 
as if God did thereby open them the gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord, and that the gate was opened for the advantage of their enemies. So these publicly declared that the signal foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them. Besides these, a few days after the feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month Artemisius, Jyar, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For, before sun-setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. Moreover, at that feast which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was, to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that, in the first place, they felt a quaking and heard a great noise, and after that they heard a sound as of a great multitude, saying, quote, Let us remove hence. End quote. But, what is still more terrible, there was one Jesus, the son of Ananus, a plebeian and a husbandman, who, four years before the war began, and at a time when the city was in very great peace and prosperity, came to that feast whereon it is our custom for every one to make tabernacles to God in the temple. Footnote. Both Reland and Haverkamp in this place alter the natural punctuation and sense of Josephus, and this contrary to the opinion of Valacillus and Dr. Hudson, lest Josephus should say that the Jews built booths or tents within the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles, which the latter rabbins will not allow to have been the ancient practice. But then, since it is expressly told us in Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 16, that in still elder times, quote, the Jews made booths in the courts of the house of God, end quote, at that festival, Josephus may well be permitted to say the same. And indeed, the modern rabbins are of very small authority on all such matters of remote antiquity, end footnote. Began on a sudden to cry aloud, quote, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the holy house, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, and a voice against this whole people. End quote. This was his cry, as he went about by day and by night, in all the lanes of the city. However, certain of the most eminent among the populace had great indignation at this dire cry of his, and took up the man, and gave him a great number of severe stripes. Yet did not he either say anything for himself, or anything peculiar to those that chastised him, but still went on with the same words which he cried before. Hereupon our rulers, supposing, as the case proved to be, that this was a sort of divine fury in the man, brought him to the Roman procurator, where he was whipped till his bones were laid bare. Yet he did not make any supplication for himself, nor shed any tears, but turning his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, at every stroke of the whip his answer was, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! And when Albinus, for he was then our procurator, asked him who he was and whence he came, and why he uttered such words, he made no manner of reply to what he said, but still did not leave off his melancholy ditty, till Albinus took him to be a madman and dismissed him. Now, during all the time that passed before the war began, this man did not go near any of the citizens, nor was seen by them while he said so. But he every day uttered these lamentable words, as if it were his premeditated vow, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! Nor did he give ill words to any of those that beat him every day, nor good words to those that gave him food. But this was his reply to all men, and indeed no other than a melancholy presage of what was to come. This cry of his was the loudest at the festivals, and he continued this ditty for seven years and five months, without growing hoarse, or being tired therewith, till the very time that he saw his presage in earnest fulfilled in our siege, when it ceased. For as he was going round upon the wall, he cried out with his utmost force, Woe, woe to the city again, and to the people, and to the holy house! and just as he added at the last, Woe, woe to myself also, there came a stone out of one of the engines, and smote him, and killed him immediately, and as he was uttering the very same presages, he gave up the ghost. 4. 
Now if any one consider these things, he will find that God takes care of mankind, and by all ways possible foreshadows to our race what is for their preservation, but that men perish by these miseries which they madly and voluntarily bring upon themselves. For the Jews, by demolishing the tower of Antonia, had made their temple four square, while at the same time they had it written in their sacred oracles, quote, that then should their city be taken, as well as their holy house, when once their temple should become four square, end quote. But now, what did the most elevate them in undertaking this war, was an ambiguous oracle that was also found in their sacred writings, how, quote, about that time, one from their country should become governor of the habitable earth, end quote. The Jews took this prediction to belong to themselves in particular, and many of the wise men were thereby deceived in their determination. Now this oracle certainly denoted the government of Vespasian, who was appointed emperor in Judea. However, it is not possible for men to avoid fate, although they see it beforehand. But these men interpreted some of these signals according to their own pleasure, and some of them they utterly despised, until their madness was demonstrated, both by the taking of their city and their own destruction. End of Book 6, Chapter 5